Thank you. Um, next session is tracking COVID-19 with a system clinical approach. Uh, with that, I'd like to pass to Lee Hu, the session chair. Currently, Lee is the senior vice president and chief strategy officer for the Institute for Systems Biology and a senior vice president and chief science officer for Providence St. Joseph Health. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to a session on tracking COVID-19 with a systems clinical approach. And certainly the previous session with Joel Dudley gave us much to think about from a computational point of view. And in this session, we'll be exploring uh, various new kinds of technologies. We have three outstanding speakers and they will go in order. Lars Steinmetz, um, Ida Grunberg, and Kevin Kurzowski. Uh, and I think you'll see some both fascinating results from technology and COVID and, and maybe even some hints about how COVID has changed our future and how we think about technology. So with that, uh, Lars, would you like to begin? Yes, I'm happy to start. So I'm here representing two hats. In a way, I co-founded Sophia Genetics in 2011, and I'm also professor of genetics at Stanford University and senior scientist at EMBL. And I'd like to tell you a bit about what we've done and how COVID-19 has impacted our work, both at the company, but also in my own labs. Sophia Genetics is a global health tech company uh, that was, um, I said, founded in 2011 and has really uh, worked on integrating healthcare institutions across the world with now a thousand healthcare institutions and diagnostic labs across 85 countries. And in total has analyzed over 600,000 genomic profiles from patients um, with about one patient every four minutes uh, coming online. Initially it was launched to be a multi-omic platform technology, um, but genomic data was the first that really uh, entered the system and has since expanded to radiomics data and clinical trial data, now also electronic health record data. And in future, uh, the company is interested in expanding in proteomics, which is also fitting given uh, our representation on this panel. And altogether, it uses advanced uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to do pattern recognition across uh, data in the system and also to develop pro prognostic predictive models. The whole platform and the data is available online. So a clinician kind of kind of log in and see this information. This also enables uh, insights gained from a patient from one part of the world, uh, say in the US, to benefit from analysis carried out on a patient with the same disease in a different country um, because annotation is shared across the system. And so that enables better uh, patient analysis and also patient management. Initially, most of the data in, in the system has been, and actually still is from cancers, somatic and inherited cancers make up about 80% of the data in the system. 20% uh, come from other inherited diseases, including rare diseases or metabolic diseases. But of course, when COVID-19 hit, um, we saw an opportunity to utilize some of our um, technologies to benefit the study of COVID-19 and, and to provide better management for these patients. And in two ways, one, to develop algorithms for uh, advanced analytics of COVID-19 viral genome sequences for better variant detection, uh, and also to use the radiomic technologies to uh, distinguish patients with more severe or more mild forms of COVID-19. I'll show you one data slide for each of these. So for the whole genome sequencing pipeline, Sophia Genetics developed an amplicon-based sequencing approach for COVID-19 uh, and launched this in a, in a study across six sites uh, of clinical partners with which it had already been working uh, and developed metrics, quality control metrices um, to assess how much read depth was necessary to detect a variance in these genomes. And with about a thousand reads, per sample or a th um, thousand copies of viral genome per sample, one can get over 89% coverage of the genome and detect alleles down to 10%. And that gives you information about where these variants arise. You can use that to track transmission of COVID-19 uh, and also see where new mutations have arisen. So for example, the spike protein, uh, we've heard about new variants uh, coming from England and also South Africa and Nigeria that show variants in these positions. And of course, 
even though we have vaccines, continuing to monitor the genomic sequence of, of the virus will continue to be important to make sure that these vaccines continue to work, but also to identify other therapeutic or diagnostic approaches. In addition, we've used the radiomic capabilities of SOFIA, which uh, include uh, using machine learning algorithms across image data. In this case, it's CT image data from lungs um, of COVID-19 patients, which are then segmented and then analyzed uh, in order to both distinguish COVID-19 lung samples from other types of lung disease samples using machine learning methods. But also more interestingly, I think to distinguish between um, very severe COVID-19 patients from less severe ones. Um, based on CT image data that was collected on the first visit of these patients to the hospital. So the algorithm was able to distinguish um, from these image data patients that eventually would enter the ICU or die of the disease versus ones that have more mild forms of the disease where they could leave the hospital um, or um, e even, even could go home or just standard of care types of analyses. In addition to the work at Sophia, my lab has also thought, been working on novel ways to diagnose this disease uh, using next generation sequence technology. Uh, and I, in my lab at EMBO, we've developed a multiplex PCR uh, amplification approach to diagnose COVID-19 that we've uh, launched to monitor our workforce as uh, the scientists are coming back to the lab. So this approach uses uh, extracted viral RNA that's then amplified uh, through a, um, a multiplex uh, PCR with uh, unique molecular identifiers and then ultimately sequenced. And with this approach, we could distinguish uh, positive COVID-19 clinical samples from employees at, of EMBOL that have gotten tested, all of which are mostly negative. Uh, and uh, we get a good distinction here one thing that we did to drive the cost down was to home purify the, all the enzymes that are needed to carry out this reaction that allows us to do a library prep per sample of 92 cents. And depending on how many samples you sequence and multiplex, you can uh, get costs of one to five uh, euros per, per sample, but you can multiplex thousands in a single reaction. In another implementation and in a collaboration with Lee Hood, uh, and Sui Wang at the Institute for Systems Biology, we've been working on developing a home test for COVID-19 uh, that uses uh, a, a, a LAMP reaction, uh, a linear isothermal amplification of the viral genome. And then, uh, which we think is unique here, an impedance-based detection of the viral sequences through sequence-specific hybridization events that happen within this electrical detection chamber. The whole device is small, portable, um, and should cost somewhere between one to two dollars to manufacture. Uh, and this is, of course, early stage, and we're we're developing that data now. And so, that's all I wanted to talk about in the presentation. I'd be happy to discuss any of these data and and to come back to any of it. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Lars. I think what we'll do is go through each of the three presentations. And then we can have uh, some general questions and so forth. So if we could turn to uh, Ida, our second speaker now, you're on. Thanks again, Lee, for this opportunity to talk about our work with broad proteomics profiling in, in COVID-19 patients. So first, just a very brief recap that we still, almost a year into the pandemic, don't fully understand the underlying cellular mechanism causing the immune response and the outcomes of, of these infections. And we also lack a comprehensive overview of the inflammation processes, but we know for sure that there are significant variances in disease severity, but there are still many unknowns why, why some people are suffering from more severe outcomes than, than others. Also, this is a disease that is in impacting multiple organs and causing both short and, and long-term effect. But we have been very fortunate to have been very close and intense collaboration with the scientific community. So we realized very early in the pandemic that what was needed was deep profiling of the immune system to be able to find predictors of severity and also find ways to, to stratify patients based on, on outcomes. We also need to find novel therapeutic targets as well as re-evaluate uh, existing ones. So we can use that to, to treat patients and also find uh, how, they, how the impact of these therapeutics are on, on organs. 
So we as a pro proteomics provider, we have from the beginning been very committed to support these studies. So our library covers secreted proteins, organ-specific markers. We have been very fortunate to collaborate with, with Lee and his group at ISB. We have a very broad library of inflammatory proteins with very high sensitivity of the low abundant markers that are especially key for these type of studies. And we also have a number of, of established drug targets and, and candidates from ongoing uh, trials in, in our library. So our platform is based on the proximity extension assay. So what's unique with that is that it's based on dual antibody recognition together with DNA barcoding. So this provides very high specificity. Then we have amplification to get sufficient sensitivity, and we have digital barcode using either NGS or qPCR. Also, what is quite unique is that we're using very limited amounts of samples, so just a microliter of, of patient uh, material. And now with using NGS, we have very high throughput, so we can screen thousands of samples per week. So our library today covers 1,500 proteins, but in the coming years, we are reaching the three and four and five and so on thousand proteins. It's fully validated. So we have been very careful about that and have also built in a quality control system. Also it's scalable. So our studies today are used for discovery, but we're also working more with clinical implementation. I'm happy to discuss more of that later. And since the beginning in March, we have run now hundreds of, of COVID studies. And I wanted to bring up one example here. So in the spring of last year, we teamed up with the COVID-19 technology access framework and partnered with the great teams at, at the Mass General Hospital and the Broad Institute, led by uh, Dr. Marsha Goldberg and Neera Cohen. So in this study, we screened 1,500 proteins in, in around 400 patients. Um, and as part of this initiative, all data was made public. So since September of last year, um, everyone can access about a million protein data um, on, on this site. So the cohort consisted of plasma samples from 306 COVID positive patients and 78 uh, COVID or symptomatic COVID-19 controls. And samples were taken at, at baseline, which was the time at the emergency room and then day three and day seven for the, the COVID positive. And then the WHO's classification was used based on outcomes um, within 28 days. Uh, and you can see the groups here. So there was uh, the patient that, uh, that died, patients getting intubated, uh, those that were hospitalized with um, oxygen supply, those without oxygen and those that were uh, discharged. So the first thing we did was to compare the, the profiles of the infections. So the infected, COVID infected ones with the symptomatic controls. Um, and we found more than 600 differentially expressed proteins associated with the infection. You can see that here in the um, volcano plot. So what we saw that uh, the COVID positive patient, they displayed higher uh, expression of um, proteins associated with viral response and interference pathway proteins, and, and also associated with vaccine response, um, innate immune inactivation and, and T cell function. So you can see many interference here. We also maybe interesting also saw decreased levels of CCL16 and, and 24. You can also see a heat map here with the top 200 um, proteins. Um, we then, moving on, we continued looking at severity associated proteins. So here we compared uh, uh, patients from group one and two. So those that were, they, they were defined as, as severe and group three, four and five as, as mild. So first of all, here you can see in the heat map, they significantly change proteins between severe and non-severe at day zero. Um, so in total, we identified more than 250 proteins that we're separating these groups. And we can look more closely into some proteins that you can see here that changed over time, over the course of the um, uh, collection time, and also how the association to uh, overall survival, like IL-6 and, and IL-8, um, and CCL2 and IL-24. Um, and then finally, perhaps the most 
optimal result would be a predictive model for, for severity or outcome. So we, did, we built a classifier based on our protein data. So the, the result was an area under the curve of 0.85, which is considered as, as good performance. Um, and then also we looked into plasma signatures or pathways mediating ARDS, so acute respiratory distress. We could also use the, the signature to stratify the most severe, so those that died from severely ill patients. And you can see the, the top thing, um, significant proteins here, I think there were 24. Um, but yeah, I don't have time now, but there are a number of other examples too. But I think to summarize, we are very, very encouraged by, by this data and see that we can actually use plasma protein profiles to be strongly predictive of disease severity. And it really highlights the, the potential use for both in clinical trials to, to enrich for patients, but also to tailor um, therapy to, to specific interventions. Um, but I think I will stop there and then leave for more discussions later. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ida. So Kevin, would you like to tell us about how we can use highly sensitive protein analyses to analyze COVID? Absolutely. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Let me see if I can get the slide up. Uh, are you able to see the slide? Yes. yes. Awesome. Um, very interesting discussion from Lars and Ida. And we really um, believe very much in the protein and the role of it. And certainly Lee, over the years, you've been the pioneer that has taught a lot of us and trailblazed in this, in this area. Our company, Samoa Technology, uh, called Quanterix, is basically going after exquisite levels of sensitivity and measuring the proteins. And by doing so, using digital technologies, we are able to, we think, transform the way health is administered by seeing very early on um, disease, long before symptoms, and also to do it non-invasively. And so this is a transformative area and independent of Quanterix, we have an ecosystem called Pyrene Precision Health where all the, the world leaders in oncology, neurology, and now infectious disease, including the major agencies, the NIH, CDC, FDA, et cetera, uh, working diligently to try to advance the field of proteomics. Um, historically, we've spent a lot of time um, in neurology by seeing brain health with a very simple um, blood test. And that was where we really started to evolve the technology. Now there's thousands of third-party peer-reviewed publications of which at least three or 400 of them are focused just on brain health, being able to see it in um, venous draws, but also uh, dry blood spots. And most of the companies shown on this slide are utilizing it to recruit patients very early in the disease cascade, long before symptoms for their drug trial cohorts. And particularly in Alzheimer's, where we've now been able to see it 16 years before dementia, it's playing a major role in getting to precognitive impairment cohorts that are highly specific for Alzheimer's by being able to rule out Lewy bodies, um, dementia, as well as frontal temporal dementia, utilizing multiple protein markers in a panel. So now that um, is really the way we had been focused when um, several outsiders came to us saying, what can you do for COVID given this crisis? And so we quickly pivoted our company towards COVID and we now have a fairly high definition roadmap. Um, but once again, you know, what we learned is that there's a lot of false negatives and false positives in today's COVID testing. And this is particularly true if you try to measure COVID before symptoms. So once again, deploying the same technology that we had been using for brain health and for oncology to see COVID before symptoms has led to many breakthroughs over the last several months. Um, I'm going to click this slide and it'll just show you when you are able to see it earlier on this curve where you can see the early stage of the actual cytokines first peaking 
And then you see the antigen starting to elevate in the blood. And then ultimately you see the adaptive immune system um, respond. And we now have the ability to measure across all of these various components and these various assays and their peaks. And that has led to some pretty significant disruption over the last uh, several months. So it started with us being able to measure the cytokine storm and predict who was going to go into the storm by seeing the interferon alpha very early. And now with our sensitivity, we're actually looking at eight different subtypes of the interferon alpha. So there's been many publications in the last couple of months just talking about the ability to stratify patients around the world in the hot zones. We ran a, a webinar on precision health uh, through the hot zones. Many of the scientists showed how by seeing interferon alpha too low or too high created the storm. And so being in that middle um, was something that that panel helped the, the field see. Then we started to see loss of taste and smell that led to sometimes brain fog. And so our NFL, Neurofilament Light, is able to measure that. And there's now several neuro neurological presentations and publications on the loss of taste and smell and being able to measure that um, with our NFL and moving that now to long haulers, trying to understand the long-term impacts. Is this going to create early stage Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS because of the neuronal death? And so the NIH, um, as well as the FDA, have been working very closely with this. The NIH has given us $20 million over the last several months to scale our tests up. They were so um, you know, very significantly promoting what we were able to see in blood of the virus, that that really um, led to some pretty big breakthroughs. We did get our EUA about uh, three weeks ago for the serology tests that we can run. Here you can see we can quantitate semi-quantitatively the IgG, but more importantly, um, our founder, um, David Walt, who's using this um, down in Bringman Women's, the same technology, we can actually run a three by four looking at three different um, IgG, IgM, and IgA across four different um, viral components. So this has been an, an amazing way to kind of get a better picture of that adaptive immune response. And then the most important area is the antigen itself where we're the only ones that have been able to showcase it in blood and see it in blood almost at times when you can't even see it in the respiratory. And lately in the long holer campaign, there's been a lot of speculation that for those that can't get rid of their symptoms over a six month period, that the, the virus is going dormant in the stomach at, at low levels and it's no longer in the respiratory. So they're testing negative, but the symptoms keep returning. So now there's a lot of work out in the NIH. Um, Anthony Fauci's group uh, under Cliff Lane now has our technology and they're running around the clock looking at it in blood. So seeing the virus move from one part of the body, respiratory, into the gut, and then being able to see um, that small level of the virus, and it comes back, the adaptive immune system crushes it for a while, and then the virus starts to grow back again is the speculation. So a lot of those types of studies are now being researched. And so having a comprehensive look at this virus across the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system, as well as the antigen and the serology, component tree, um, we think has been really helpful and we're pretty excited about continuing that advance. And the whole area of proteomics, we think um, is just beginning and Quanteric sits kind of at the end of the pipeline before drug trials. Um, we're trying to advance further into the diagnostic sector, but ultimately we do love um, a lot of the diagnostics and the discovery of proteins, which we think today it's only five to 10% covered. And so the things that we heard from Ida and others, we think are incredibly productive for the future of this field. Thank you very much, Lee. Well, thank you, Kevin. So uh, I'd, I'd like to address uh, to each of you just a general question. You've told us a little bit about the kinds of things that uh, you can do with your technologies. My question relates to a more general question of, has the uh, social and financial imperatives of COVID really pushed you in new and different directions, uh, directions that you can see uh, could be applied broadly to other things in the future? And, you know, just a brief answer is uh, all we're looking for. So uh, Lars, do you want to start? 
Yeah, maybe I could say, uh, so from Sophia's perspective, I mean, one of the things that certainly had helped us, I think, respond to the pandemic and, you know, keep our genetic diagnostics operational was the fact that a lot of it happens in the cloud and is based on compute servers that, you know, are maintained uh, centrally, but not locally um, at, you know, at a more global level. So this didn't uh, require shutdown to happen as as it did, you know, in my academic labs where, you know, things really went, um, you know, stalled for some time until we were allowed to go back into lab and restart these projects. So I think one of the things that we've learned um, from, from COVID-19 is, is, you know, to, uh, to deal with that challenge of um, not being able to operate locally, but, you know, move more of our systems in, into a cloud-based setting and to operate there. Now in Sofia, that was already the case in an, in an academic lab setting. Um, we had to move to a lot of things, you know, with remote calls and focus on manuscript writing and, and you know, and grant preparations um, before we could move to new data collection. So certainly that has had an impact on both sides. So let me ask one more question, Lars, and that is with the emergence of the British mutant, there is, a real imperative for sequencing viral genomes in everybody. Yeah. Does that, do you think we have the technologies to manage that with what you described? Or do you think we have to go beyond what you've done even? Well, I think there, I mean, certainly there is room for more improvement, right? I would always say that being an interested individual in technology development and focusing my academic labs in that space. Though I think we have products already that are there uh, to, to, to do large scale um, COVID sequencing. And there, you know, there are collectively over 300,000 COVID genomes in uh, public databases already. So I, I think a lot of that data though still is uh, riddled with some you know, false positives and errors. Uh, and it would be probably good to, you know, to redo these with uh, more accurate um, sequencing approaches. And that's why kind of Sophia put a focus on benchmarking the accuracy of, of these whole genome sequencing methods across different sites to come up with recommendations, including kind of how deep to sequence um, and what you will be able to detect. Because I think one, one challenge is certainly low variant allele fractions. We know that this virus mutates. There's a new mutation arising every two weeks. Uh, and possibly even in individual patients, uh, as the virus propagates, new mutations will arise, giving, uh, you know, giving rise to heterogeneity in the sequence. And, and being able to detect all that really does require, um, you know, approaches that focus on quality control and understand the limits of detection um, in the resulting data. Thank you. So, Ida, how about uh, your thoughts? Definitely, it has definitely had an impact on, on us as well as at, at Olingon in, in many different aspects. So first of all, we have 1500 proteins, but we have realized that we need to go beyond that, which was the plan already before COVID-19, but now we're trying to speed up the process even more. So that's why reaching 3000 this year and, and trying as fast as possible to reach the, the whole plasma proteome, but also we are trying to see since our technology is very flexible and scalable so we are now on two different alternative platforms so we can be more agnostic to have the outreach of our technology on more sites using both next generation sequencing and, and qpcr also in different formats formats and, and um, ways of, of running broad proteomics so high plex to low plex and relative and absolute quantification and more custom based so we're trying to, to listen to, to all the feedback that we have received. Also what, what Kevin was mentioning more, home sampling. That's of course is very interesting uh, area as well to be more prepared for, for the next time. So can we do more to help more maybe more outpatients and, and not having patients going into the ER, but maybe predict that before and, and can tell who's gonna stay at home. So definitely it had an impact on us. And, we think that it's exciting to be part of this and trying to, again, be prepared for next. So a question for you then is, you, you have focused on the plasma proteome, and I agree, that's absolutely the proteome you want to start with. But what about the other proteomes, things that don't necessarily get into the blood? I mean, mm -hmm. do you have plans for being able to look at those proteins as well? 
so so we do definitely plasma and serum are the main sample matrices that that we are running and also what we have focused on and, and done all the validation on but we do also a lot of work on on csf for example like what kevin presented but also other matrices i think when i was also mentioning the small volume requirement that we have of a microliter that opens up a lot of opportunities in pediatrics i mean small tissue biopsies from from tumors and so on so we're also doing more and more uh, work and optimizations on, on other matrices. And again, with home sampling, filter papers, dry blood spots, uh, different devices where you collect minute amount of, of samples. So the, the technology is very flexible for basically all types of, of sample types, but our focus has been blood. So how about uh, single cell analysis? That's another really critical area, obviously. Yeah. So we have done some some studies. There are some papers also on, on single cell proteomics with our um, with our panels. So that works. It hasn't been our focus, but it's definitely an interesting area that we I think at some point uh, will will move into as well. Uh, but there are both um, collection where you can source uh, or sort single cells and then run a, a panel. And a microliter is is very small. So as long as you have that, we yeah. can run it. And the sensitivity is is, is quite impressive as well. So yeah. it's definitely doable. So Kevin, you uh, gave us a lot of directions that COVID is pushing you. Uh, a, I wonder if you had any further comments. And B, I'd be interested in how broad the spectrum of proteins are that you can analyze because one dimension of opportunity is sensitivity, but another uh, opportunity is being able to do global, uh, that is systems driven analyses. So uh, I love A, your thoughts on any other directions you've been pushed and B, uh, in, a, in a sense, how do you see scaling up so that you, you can look at more than uh, the limited number of proteins you're visualizing now? You've asked some uh, profound questions and we are, uh, first of all, you know, to your first question around socialization, we had this vision that if you could see proteins with exquisite sensitivity, there's a lot of ways you can translate sensitivity into productivity, even multiplexing you give up a lot of sensitivity when you multiplex. And so getting to the more system category, we think continuing to persevere and drive, and we just did another 100X on top of the 1000X, we think we can translate a lot of that sensitivity into some profound understanding of the multiplex, which does give you the systems approach. And I gotta tell you, the Zoom era is what probably transformed us the most because this precision health ecosystem around low invasive testing to see disease before symptoms has just exploded with people being able to link in with us from around the world on every topic that we've had and COVID has brought it to the forefront. We're a publicly traded company and our valuations have gone off the charts even though we really haven't had tailwinds from COVID yet. This is really even around the Alzheimer's and around the things we're doing inside the body, many of the same companies, the lilies of the world are then shifting over into COVID with a lot of their synthetic antibody treatments or the Gileads looking at the remdesivir. And so across the board, people are looking at these proteins and you made a comment that I thought was profound and that is, are you gonna be able to look for proteins that aren't in blood? And I could tell you when we first started, a lot of people said, you're not gonna find the proteins we're finding in blood, in blood, because they stay inside the cerebral spinal fluid. There's the blood brain barrier that there was a belief that it doesn't cross it at times. And we were able to find these proteins at very low concentrations and correlate them to what's in the cerebral spinal fluid. So that then opened up home care sampling, which transforms neuro health because now you're able to do with home care sampling dry blood spots or even saliva to see these proteins at exquisitely low sensitive levels so the large pair groups now have discovered us and they're the ones that the united health groups and the folks that have 70 million members they're interested to kind of find disease very early so they can economically treat it and then extend life health um, if you can extend life expectancy by getting the disease before symptoms and treating it 
you can transform healthcare. So to me, the payer groups are really found us through the Zoom over the last uh, four or five months. And now I think we're onto a path where the protein is going to become a revolutionary opportunity to transform healthcare, which is what we've all known, but COVID has brought it to the forefront in my mind, Lee. Yeah. So let me just push you. How many different proteins can you detect? And what are your plans for expanding your repertoire of so detection? Yeah, so right now we have this thing called homebrew where we allow our customers to devise their own ability to measure it in our system. And so we've got probably 80 to 100 proteins that are off the shelf. Now we've got, you know, diagnostic for, you know, SARS. We've got the antigen. We just got the EUA actually two days ago for the antigen test. And we got the serology. Those are the only two that are diagnostic, but we probably got 100 that are off the shelf kits. And then many of those are multiplexed into maybe sixplex. But then our customers have found another two or 300 that they've used our technology for. So we're only sitting today at probably 200, 300 proteins. But I actually believe what, you know, Ida's up to is like the next generation of opportunity. We saw Sears go public. Um, I'm running, I'm the chairman of another company, 908 Devices, which is a little handheld mass spectrometer. So I think the whole field of proteomics is only five to 10% covered today. And if you can get to the low invasive testing in home, prevent all the infection carrying of having to get exposure, I think that you could get to thousands of proteins. And I think Eda's already at 1500. Sear suggests that they might be at 5,000 um, or maybe Somalogic feels that way. I think that there's at least 10 to 15,000 that you should be able to get to. And when you do, I think you're going to have big translational opportunities that dwarf what's been going on in genomics. And our founder founded Illumina, so he actually is very compelled by the protein. And so I, I think it's the future. And I think you had this uh, vision way at the beginning, Lee, and I think it's starting to come to fruition right now in 2021. No, it's an exciting time. I agree. So um, Lars, let me ask you about the home device you mentioned. What do you see are the real advantages in that device vis-a-vis -vis, uh, having everyone have in their home a simple detection device for nucleic acids uh, and things like that? All right. One of, one of the advantages of the design that we've, you know, that we've currently drafted is that it's based, since it's based on sequence detection, it would be, um, you know, purposeable for other pathogens as well. Um, you can design, you know, probes that detect a variety of different sequences. And so with the same kind of detection technology, you could potentially do more than uh, COVID-19. Um, that's one of the attractive areas. Uh, the other way you could multiplex is do multiple patient samples in parallel through, you know, parallel impedance chambers mm -hmm. uh, and therefore scale kind of the, the, the assay uh, dramatically, um, potentially to several thousands. Um, and, and, the, and the fact that that device, as we've currently designed it, is entirely portable, and you could either make that on a single device or on two devices, where you could have the impedance readout sensor on one device, and then a cartridge that actually contains the chambers that are exposed to the sample, which could be disposed. Um, you could, you know, make the actual test on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, even, you know, in the sense range, um, once you've purchased, you know, a single detection uh, cartridge. Um, and we think that home testing is certainly, um, as it was brought up, you know, from both Ida and Kevin, you know, home analysis is, is going to be important because there's so many asymptomatic carriers out there. And if we can detect, you know, the virus earlier and can detect patients that carry the virus earlier, then even on top of the immunization that occurs, this will provide an additional control because I think it's going to take some time until the vaccination, the immune, uh, you know, population based Im immune um, response is going to be broad enough in order to contain further transmission of the virus. So I think these things we need both, and um, and I, I think we'll we'll continue to need uh, home based testing. I think Lee just dropped off. But maybe I'll ask you a, a question, Kevin, uh, that kind of came up in your presentation. 
and, and Ida touched on it too, um, in terms of protein detection and, and the ability really to detect the disease as early as possible. And I clearly, I fully agree with you, the more sensitive we can be on, on protein detection, the better. Um, are, are, is it going to be possible to drive this, uh, you know, to be as early of a detection technology as would be with nucleic acid-based detection of the viral genome? That's currently the gold standard. And have you done some analyses there to compare the two? We have. Uh, in fact, um, that was actually the, the initial seminal present uh, publications that came out was that this wasn't a, the ability to see the protein at the same sensitivity as DNA, which was really one of the game changing components. And it's been real interesting in looking at the number um, of copies of the virus in COVID and there are standards um, down at the FDA that we're working with uh, Tim Stenzel on that deal with, you know, seeing it with, uh, you know, quantitative PCR and then what we can see with the antigen. And, you know, we're pretty much at equivalent levels today. And we think that that's been one of the game changing components to what brought DNA to where it's gotten to. So being able to do that repeatedly and in a democratized way by making instruments that can be democratized out throughout the world, repeatedly get to that sensitivity with the protein is what we think is creating the, 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 the rapid trajectory of value creation in the proteomics field. So I actually think that you're absolutely right. And, and we've got some, of the publications that show the ability to even get to digital PCR levels of sensitivity with, with the Samoa as a, as a protein analytics and then quantitating the protein. That's the other big piece of this is the quantitation for like these IgG markers and antigen markers. We're seeing huge stratification opportunities just in being able to measure how much of the antigen. We can almost predict how severe someone's going to be based on the level of antibodies opposite the amount of antigen. So they're looking at those indexes of, the, of those two to be able to make those kind of predictions. And quantitation, I think, will be key to helping unravel much of the, the virus's mystery right now. So I apologize. I'm on Friday Harbor with a low bandwidth internet, and occasionally I drop out and everything. But I have uh, one more question for Ida. And, and that is, there is one other company that has large-scale protein analysis, SomaLogic, and I'd love to hear your uh, comparative analysis of the two platforms. Yes, so they 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 have an excellent uh, technology or an excellent solution to to antibodies that, of course, is can be limited, and and we are of course limited to antibodies in 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 our case, and we are using two for each assay. So using aftermers could be a, a, a great solution to overcome that. Uh, we have had kind of different strategies. We have since the beginning been very focused on, on, on the technical performance and, and doing a lot of validation for each of our assays. So it has been taking us a longer time to reach the thousands and, uh, of, of assays. But of course, there are already comparison and, and the correlation between the two platforms out there. So there are published papers as well. So there are different, there are some overlaps and there are some assays that are not overlapping and also some good, I think what, what is also a strength that we haven't had time to talk about yet here is also the, the work that is going on in the proteogenomic space. So we are doing more and more of that. So you can also see how, how protein expressions are linked to, to, to genes. And that's a good way to also do orthogonal validation of two comparative uh, proteomic platforms. Yeah. So I encourage the, the audience to, to look at some of those correlation. But again, I think our focus has been on, on validation and, and assuring high quality from, from doing a lot of, of testing on technical performance. It takes a bit longer, but we believe in, in quality. Okay. Um, do any of you have questions for one another? I have one more comment that I would make, and that is, I think one of the enormous, just barely emerging frontiers of biology is single cell analysis. And it seems that really all the technologies we've talked about here have unique possibilities for contribution. But again, uh, questions of the scale of proteins or nucleic acids that can be measured and their accuracy uh, and, and, and most of all, the cost and so forth are really 
critical kind of questions. And I'm just wondering if each of you sees this as an opportunity, or I'll ask a more general question. Do you see other opportunities we haven't really thought about deeply emerging from COFAD, where we ought to think about uh, the analysis and integration of information from different kinds of informational molecules or so? Very broad, very general question, but I'd be, I'd be curious what you think. So Lars? I think maybe I'll, I'll keep it very short, but mention two things that, that came to mind. One is, which I already touched on earlier, is the ability to, using nucleic acids to multiplex and detect multiple pathogens in parallel. I think if we had the focus that we've placed now on COVID-19, you know, worldwide, not only us, but everybody, uh, in developing detection technologies, if we had done that 20 years ago, uh, I think we'd be much more, you know, rapid and more quick off the blocks here for COVID-19. And the same types of technologies that we're developing for COVID-19 can be repurposed for other pathogens. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity going forward in detecting multiple pathogens, and including you know, organ-specific biomarkers in blood through you know, analysis of uh, proteins, for example, uh, that we've heard about too. Um, I think there are tremendous opportunities um, within that space. And the second area is in vaccination. I think the R mRNA-based vaccination also, again, a nucleic acid-based technology, because it's sequence-based, can be repurposed to target other types of diseases, and it's been applied for cancers, and certainly for other pathogens, I think, is an opportunity, too. So I see two things that really, you know, have, you know, entered into the big arena from COVID-19, but provide a lot of opportunity in the future. Thank you. Ida, any, any comments on your side? I can, I can only speak from the proteomic side. So we have tried to, to, to piggyback on the genomics trend with, with the cost revolution they have done. And that was one of the, one of the reasons why we also decided to, to go with, with NDS as a readout. So that will, we think at least enable our community to, to run larger studies. And then yes, the second one that I also think is great to see how COVID has had, had an impact on, on the society that we can do more share more data and, and do it more in open access and publicly available to, to speed up the, the process and, and not sit on data, but actually share and, and help each other out. So that's... So Kevin, briefly, since I think we're almost at the end of our time. I do think heterogeneity is, is key in getting to the single cell and then being able to measure how many proteins are on each of those cells is critical for the future. I really am a huge proponent of disease prevention, and I think that the protein offers so much opportunity for us to all empower our own ability, someday having biomarker watches that are real Fitbits on steroids, I think is the future to navigate your own health journey with proteins in the future. So uh, great session. Thank you. Well, I want to thank each of our speakers. You've brought us distinct visions of the opportunities COFAD has presented. And, and you, I think, have all clearly expressed where COFAD is going to be pushing us in the future and how much of what we've done is, is going to be applicable to other diseases. And I think one of the most interesting comments made today by Kevin was the idea that Zoom has given the ability for collaborative interactions at a scale that were utterly inconceivable prior to this time. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody and uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, a superb panel. <laughs>